Okay, today's lecture is going to be kind of short, but I want to make sure that we touch on the metric system before we go on to do it on Monday or Tuesday for our labs. So most scientists are going to use the metric system when collecting data. Now metric units move in units of 10. So it's just a moving the number or the decimal point either up or down one spot. And that's what's great about the metric system is it's only moving units of 10. So whereas in our standard system 12 inches equals one foot the metric system, it's all units of 10. 10 millimeters equals 1 centimeter. So it all moves in a very solid, standard way. Now, what else is great about the metric system is we have three different units of measure that all have the same prefix. So we have length is measured in meters, volume is measured in liters, and mass is measured in grams. And what's great about this is if I have a centimeter to a millimeter in terms of a conversion, that same conversion is done centiliter to milliliters. Okay? These, these prefixes, centi, milli, uh, kilo, they are all used throughout grams. I'm sure you've heard kilograms, milliliters. Okay? All of these are used in metric units. Now, the multipliers here our kilo is times 10 to the third, centi is 10 to the negative 2, milli is 10 to the negative 3. And when we say this, it, it might be a little confusing to you. So what I've found is I found a children's conversion table. Now it's, it's, it's very childish, but it does the job. So if we take a look and we see right in the middle where that sneaker is, it says base unit, gram, meter, liter. So all you have to do is either multiply or divide by 10 as you go down the steps. So let's imagine that that sneaker goes down the steps. All right? And we'll just say that that sneaker is one sneaker, one meter. Okay. So as we go down, you see how on the side it says to convert 10 times as we go down the steps. We multiply by 10. So one meter is 10 deciliters. And then we multiply that by 10 again. So that would be 100 centimeters, and then again to go down a thousand millimeters. So each time we go down the step, we multiply by 10. And the same happens as we go up. We divide by 10 as we go up. So if we were to go from millimeters, if we had one, to deca, it would be 0 0.1. All right? If we were to go again, we would divide by 10 again. 0 0.1 divided by 10 is 0 0.01 for hecto. And if we go up again, it would be 0 0.001. Okay? And that's basic conversion. And I really like this picture like it's going up and down steps. So each time you move a step, you either divide by 10 if you're going up, or you multiply by 10 if you're going down. Now I've got a little example here. If we started with a 5 Five kilometers. Now I use meters because meters is the thing that I deal with the most as a track coach. But I'm sure you've all heard of a 5K. That's a five kilometer race. Five kilometers. So if we take a look and we follow, so imagine we were at the very top step of this picture right here. All right. So we're at the very top step. If we were to go here and we have five kilometers. So now we're going to divide, because remember, as we go down the steps, we divide. Or I'm sorry, we multiply. I'm saying that wrong. Uh, we multiply as we go down the steps. 5 kilometers times 10 is 50 hectometers. Times 10 is 500 decameters. Times 10 is 5,000 meters. Times 10 is 50,000 decimeters. Times 10 again is 5 hundred thousand centimeters and times 10 again is five million millimeters. So we just went down the steps. Imagine we were on the very top step there. We had five and we multiplied by 10 going down all those steps. Now we could replace the word meter with liters or grams depending on what we were dealing with. If we started with five kilograms or we started with five kiloliters um, and we just moved down. 
that's all that we're doing. We're just moving up and down steps. That's all the metric system is. It's, very, it's a very simple system. And what we'll do during the lab is we will put ourselves in a position where we can see what these things are relative to each other. How much bigger is five kilometers than five you know, than five meters. Uh, so we'll put it in a position by going outside and really looking at it that you can identify and really understand the metric system. Okay? And the same is true if we were to go back up the steps and we started at that five million millimeters and went up, we would just divide by 10 each step. All right? So now the hecto, deca, and deci are not commonly used, but it's important for us to know that they're there because we can't just skip steps, we can't jump steps, all right? Because then we would end up not multiplying correctly. If we didn't multiply correctly, we wouldn't have the correct value for our conversion. Okay? And we'll spend more time on this talking about it, but this should give you a basic understanding of the metric system. Now here are some common metric units, some common metric conversions that your textbook gives. Um, the big one that's different on this one that, that we haven't talked about yet is obviously the temperature. Now the freezing point is zero, the boiling point is a hundred, all right, and that is Celsius. So zero degrees Celsius is freezing, hundred degrees is boiling. So it's very, very easy to remember, okay? Now also it shows some common ones for, for uh, measurement. Uh, mass we might use in here, volume we'll use, and length we'll use. But we're obviously not going to get to the point where we're dealing with a metric ton in class. All right? And what we'll deal with here is we will deal with uh, maybe some uh, liquid measurement, um, a certain amount. You'll definitely deal with liquid measurement in chemistry. Uh, and you'll definitely deal with uh, length and mass if you go on to take physics. Okay. Now, another thing that you have to realize is in science, we're still talking about scientific principles. This isn't just the metric system here. We're gathering and organizing information. And graphs are a common way for a scientist to present and organize and analyze their information. Now, the common graphs that you're going to deal with are a pie graph, a line graph, and a bar graph. And I'll tell you right now, there is a 0% chance that you will do a pie graph on the regions. Okay? You will do most likely do a line graph. I'd say 8 out of 10 times you do a line graph on the regions. 1 out of 10 times you're going to do a bar graph. So what I've got here is I've got an example of a two-line line graph for you. And now we have the independent variable is on the x-axis, time. So time is the independent variable. And we're dealing with the amount of water absorbed by roots or released by leaves. So these are two different graphs that are put onto one axis. So the time is the independent variable. That's the thing that changes. And the change in time results in the change in absorption or release of the roots. So the released by leaves or absorbed by roots is the dependent variable. So what we have here is we just have a graph where they've gone along and just plotted the points. But the big thing I want you to notice is that the value of each box is the same. All right, The time between each, uh, each line, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. is a two-hour time difference. And on the y-axis, it's 5, 10, 15, 20. It has to be constant or else you will lose points on the regions. All right, talking about more gathering and organizing information, we have microscopes, our devices that produce magnified images of structures that are too small to see with the naked eye. And we've all seen that in class. We will do many labs with microscopes where we see things that are too small for us to normally see. Now, a light microscope produces images by focusing visible light rays. Now, that's what we deal with here in class. We have nice light microscopes. They focus the light. We make it look nice, and we can see things. Now, if we look here, an electron microscope that we see on the right focuses beams of electrons. Now we see a transmission electron microscope has the electron source at the top and it focuses the electrons down through the specimen, through the objective lens, through a projector lens, and then we can see it. All right, and on the, on the left there we just see a very standard light microscope that we've dealt with in class. Cell cultures 
are a group of cells that originally developed from a single cell and develop into many cells. So this is a bacterial cell culture on an auger plate right here. And we'll have plenty of these for you to look at as AP will be doing many, many cell cultures throughout the course of the year. Cell fractionation, which we won't deal with, but is a technique to separate different parts of the cells. They're placed in a special blender. They're added to a liquid placed in a tube, and then they're centrifuged. And I have a centrifuge in the back that I can take out and show you that'll help you to understand it. Now what it does is it spins it, all right, so that the, um, the most dense parts will travel to the bottom and the less dense will, will stay at the top. And this allows the scientist to study cells from a very specific layer. All right? And that is the end of chapter one. Uh, you have the questions to do at the end. And that is that.